Francisca Viga Walsh, thank you for speaking to us today. Um, thank you. Would you tell us, in general terms, about the impact that sexual violence has on communities in, East, in the Eastern DRC? Um, well, the impact is great, especially in a culture where sexual violence was not um, something that was practiced. Many people. Many people seem to say, well, you know, it, it, it's perhaps it's cultural. Well, that's absolutely wrong. Um, it, it, it's not, and it's a gross violation of human rights. The impact is that it destroys the family. It destroys the self-esteem of the woman, um, the woman, girl, and man, because we are increasingly seeing a phenomenon in male perpetrated rape, um, excuse me, uh, male rape. Um, it... it it destroys the community and, and the person's uh, capacity to move forward in life. Post-traumatic stress disorder can be lifelong, everlasting. Um, and of course, the United Nations says some 200,000 women have been sexually abused in the Democratic Republic of Congo since 1998, if, I'm, if my statistics are correct. Uh, are there some other statistics that express the extent of the problem in Eastern DRC? Sure. Well, yes, to clarify, first of all, that was said in 2008. So you can imagine that was said over the span of 10 years. Since then, um, we've seen thousands of rapes. I believe it was about 8,000 roughly in South Kivu. Um, since, uh, you know, with the August rapes in, in uh, Luvungi and in, in Walikali territory, 200 plus there, uh, once again in January in Fizi. I think what's key is that these numbers really don't tell us anything because at the end of the day, the numbers will always be underreported um, because of the fear of stigmatization, because of the fear of retaliation. So it, it's, it's important to never assume that that number is the fixed number. It is likely to be much higher. What can communities do? What have they been able to do until now to recover? Um, well, I think that, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, the Congolese are an incredibly resilient people. I have a great amount of respect for them, um, in particular for the Congolese woman. So I think that they do rely on their own resilience. And in addition to that, thanks to the funding and international funding and programs, we're able, we the humanitarian community at large, are able to provide key assistance that facilitates them capitalizing on their resilience, if that makes any sense it to you. It makes perfect sense. Okay. But you spoke in particular about the role of women during your testimony, how women should be included in decision mechanisms. Would you expand on that just a little bit for our viewers in Africa? Yeah. Um, well, we cannot, in a country where at least 54% of the population is female, we can't expect that it be a solely male-dominated political culture. I mean, women have a voice. In fact, the Congo is one of the countries where I would say there is the largest and most vibrant women's civil society, um, among the most vibrant civil societies. So to sideline them and not include them when they can harness so much of, of their constituency's power um, into making key decisions, national action plans, um, in moving the national agenda forward, their voice is critical. Thank you so very much.